Kaiser, is everything ready for you? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Okay, well, um, I think maybe we can start this session. Yeah, so it's a pleasure to introduce this lecture by Kaiser Mathemaki, this European Mathematical Society Prize Lecture. Um, I first met Kaiser a very long time ago when she was actually a beginning graduate student at Royal Holloway. And already at that time, she had really impressive results, um, best known results, for example, on approximating real numbers by rationals with prime denominator. And she's gone on to become really one of the leading researchers in analytic number theory of her generation. Um, her breakthrough work in 2006 with Maxime Rajiwi uh, on correlations of the Merbius function, that can really be thought of as sort of some of the most substantial progress towards the twin prime conjecture in, in several decades. And that work has opened the way for many, many other exciting developments, many of which Kaiser has been involved with. Uh, she's also the head of a, a burgeoning school in Finland that's output several excellent young researchers, um, two of whom have, have come to, to Oxford for a, for a while, which has been great. Um, so without further ado, let me hand over to Kaiser, and she's going to talk to us today um, on primes, almost primes, and the Merbius function in short intervals. Okay, thanks for the kind kind introduction and uh, it's of course a great honor to receive such a prize and be able to deliver a prize lecture. So I will talk about primes, almost primes and the Möbius in short intervals and this can be seen as a sort of an introduction to analytic number theory. So I hope there are people who don't know too much about the topic. Okay, so as for the what I will talking about, I will start with the primes. I will talk about primes and discuss how they are related to the zeta function. And then I will talk about primes in short intervals and about almost primes. And then I will move on to the Möbius function and to Möbius function in short intervals. And then I will give very rough ideas of how proofs in this area work. And then I will go back to presenting the theorems again to remind you. But I will start with the very basics about the primes. So I will write blackboard P for the set of primes. So the numbers that are not divisible by anything else than one and nine. And also I will write P always for a prime. Okay. And uh, the first theorem about primes is more than 2000 years old. They are created in 300 BC. So that there are infinite many primes. And this is sort of an Suppose that we all, all, only have finitely many primes, p1 to pk, then we can multiply them together and add one, then this can't be divisible by any of these existing primes because the residue is always one. And uh, so it must be a new prime or it must be divisible by some other prime. So we get the contradiction. So this is how we know that there are infinitely many primes. Okay, and another theorem of Euclid is that every can be uniquely written as a product of primes. So for instance, 2021 is 43 times 47. And uh, this makes primes sort of the building blocks of the integers. Okay, so let me first discuss this building block analogy a bit more. So uh, is it a good analog or not? So if we want to factor a given integer, it's quite slow, even for a computer that, that's there sort of the cryptography is, for instance, based on if you have a huge integer, then it takes a lot of time from a computer to figure out what primes you have to multiply to get that integer. And on the other hand, building integers that is multiplying is fast. If, if we have some numbers, a computer can very fast multiply them. So this is completely different from if you have building blocks. Building with the building blocks, it takes a lot of time and concentration, whereas factoring the building, it's you can do it with your left hand and no concentration needed. So I like to think that the Legos are a more accurate model because they stick together. It takes much more time to deconstruct them than for the building box. And also you need more and more primes to construct all the integers and similarly for the Legos, you need more and more Legos to be able to make more and more buildings as I will soon show you. Anyway, you could sort of write many primes, but we have known for a long time much more than that. Hadamard and De La Vole Poussin sort independently in 1896 that the number of primes up to x is about x over log x. Uh, 
here you can make a more precise error than if you take the logarithm integral, but for our purposes, it suffices to say that it's about x over log x. And uh, this is called the prime number theorem. And uh, it essentially says that the probability that an integer n is prime is about one over log n. And uh, due to this and some technical things, it's convenient to normalize primes p by log p so that the sort of density becomes one uh, or the average. And uh, more precisely, we get capital lambda to be the von Mangold function. It's at n, it's log p if n, n is a power of prime and it's zero otherwise. And here the prime powers, they usually don't make any difference because they are so sparse. So this is essentially weighting primes by log p, but for technical reasons, it's convenient to have a weight also at prime powers. And now the prime number theorem is equivalent to the fact that the average value of the von Mangold function is one. Okay, so I said in the beginning that there is a relation to the theta zeros. So let me explain why the theta function is related to the primes. So the Riemann theta function is defined when the real part of S is greater than one. It's defined by the series of one over n to S, and this converges in this region. And uh, by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, it can be also written as an Euler product, the product over primes, because every n is a unique product of primes or prime powers. And uh, by the sum of the geometric series, we can write this Euler product also in this form as a product of one minus one over p to s to minus one. And uh, the zeta function can be analytically continued to the whole complex plane, except that there's a pole at s equal to one. And uh, this becomes the harmonic series which diverges. And uh, the theta s, as I already said, is called the Riemann zeta function. And uh, now the zeros of the zeta functions are the, one of the most interesting features it has. And uh, there are some trivial zeros, but the non trivial zeros are the zeros whose real part is between zero and one. And the famous Riemann hypothesis is non-trivial zeros should have real part equal to half. They should lie on the same half line, all of them. And uh, actually, how the primes are related to the zeros of the theta. First of all, the prime number theorem, that they, which says that the number of primes up to x is about x over log x, it's equivalent to the fact that the Riemann zeta function has no zeros with real part of s equal to one in the sort of edge of the critical strip. And on the other hand, the Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to having a very, very good error term in the prime number theorem. Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to the fact that the von Mangold function sums to x plus an error term, which is x to half plus epsilon for any epsilon. And uh, so why? Why can we rewrite the zeros of the theta to the primes or what are they round? This is since if we look at the uh, logarithmic derivative of the theta, which is minus theta prime over theta. So that's the logarithmic derivative of theta. We can plug in the Euler product for the theta, that definition. And if we do the derivation, we find out that the logarithmic minus logarithmic derivative of theta is the Dirichlet series where we have one Mangold function as coefficients. And furthermore, we can use a contour integration formula, which allows us to pick a condition like an inequality. Say why, why is smaller than one, it becomes one, and why, if y is greater than one, it becomes zero. And the contour integration that one has to do is of this shape. And uh, combining these two things gives us a relation between the von Mangold function and the zeta. So we have the sum of the von Mangold function. We want to show that this sum of von Mangold up to x is about x. That would be the prime number theorem. We pick up this condition that n is at most x by using this contour integration. We put y to be n over x. So this is, we, we pick up this condition by using this contour integral with y equal to n over x. So we get rid of this condition. And instead, we get the contour integration here. And uh, this way, if we change the order of integration and summation here, we get the series of von Mangold at n over n to s, which was the, well, there's a minus sign missing, I guess. 
zeta prime over zeta, and then we have x to s over s. Yeah. So this is what we obtained from the contour integration and the Euler product. And now from here, we can see the relation between the zeta zeros and the prime number theorem. We, here we can move the integration to the left, but if we do it, we first pick up a pole at s equal to one because the zeta function has a pole there. And this gives us a residue, which s equal to one here gives us x. So this is the main term x. And when we move to the left, we also have both zeta prime over zeta have a pole at every zero of the zeta function. So if we move the integration to the left, we encounter some poles at zeros of the zeta, and this gives us some error terms. In particular, if we know some zero free region for the zeta function, we can move the integration a bit left from the one line, and this allows us to prove the prime number theorem. And actually, the prime number theorem turns out to be equivalent to the fact that there are no zeros at real partic s equal to one. One has to be a bit careful to derive that, but it's possible. And on the other hand, if we assume the Riemann hypothesis, we can move the integration to the line where the real part of s is half plus epsilon for an epsilon. And this allows us to get the error term because here then we have the things of size x to half plus epsilon. I don't go into details, but this is roughly where the equivalence comes from. Okay, and one can show also some much more basic things from this zeta function. We can just show the infinitude of primes rather than showing the prime number theorem. So the zeta function is defined as the series of one over n to s, and uh, it is the has the order product. And if we now take logs on both sides and get s ten to one, then we have here the harmonic series. So this tends to infinity with this s tending to one, and uh, taking logs here, this becomes essentially sum of one over p, and we see that the sum of, of one over p diverges from this argument. So this gives us a bit more information than the institute of params by a very elementary method. We see that the series of one over p diverges. Okay, and uh, let's get back to the Lego analog. Similarly, if we have that the number of buildings is tending to infinity, so also the number of bricks must tend to infinity. Similarly, as the number of integers is tending to infinity, we have, must have that the number of primes is tending to infinity. Okay. But then in my title, I had things in short intervals. It's the title was too long to be seen here, but it's having the word short intervals here. So I will move on to talking about first primes in short intervals. So as I, well, the prime number theorem tells us that the density of primes is about one over log x, but then one can ask, what about if we look at shorter segments of length h, is the density of primes still one over log x in such short segments? And uh, the answer is yes, as long as the short is not too short. In particular, Huxley's prime number theorem from 1972 shows us that the number of primes, we get the expected prime number theorem in short intervals, as long as the length of the interval is at least x to 7 over 12 plus epsilon. And uh, the proof of this is, again, based on zeros of the Riemann zeta function. And uh, no one uses uh, a zero density estimate, which tells us information about the number of zeros that are in certain rectangles. So we have a nice upper bound of Huxley for number of zeros whose real part is at least sigma and whose imaginary part is at, at most t. So we would expect by Riemann hypothesis that for sigma greater than half, this is always zero, but this is something we can't show. But Huxley so does some partial information about this. In particular, if sigma is close to one, then there are very few zeros by this. And uh, by using this in the contour integration argument, one can show the prime number theorem in short intervals. And this 12 over 5 here is related to the 7 over 12 here. And uh, this old result, it's almost 50 years old now, but it has resisted improvements. The only improvement is due to Heat Brown from 1988, who managed to replace this plus epsilon by little, minus little over of 1. So one can go into tiny bit shorter intervals than x to 7 over 12, but not much if one wants to get an 
asymptotic formula for the number of primes in the interval. Uh, if one doesn't require an asymptotic formula, but instead is happy with just having a lower bound of correct order of magnitude, then can, one can do some sort of intervals. Make Hamann and Pins so use the same method to solve that intervals of length x to 0.525 always contain the expected order of magnitude of primes. But if one goes to sort the intervals, then one doesn't even know the existence of primes. If one assumes Riemann hypothesis, then we know that intervals of length x to half log x always contains primes, which actually is not too far from what is known unconditionally. Uh, one expects much more. Actually, Kramer made a probabilistic model, which was based on the simple thing that the probability of n being prime is about one over log n. And based on this probabilistic model, we expect that intervals of length log x to two plus epsilon always contain primes for all large x, um, and actually a bit shorter. But anyway, there is a huge gap between what's known and what's expected. We know that intervals of length x to 0.525 contain primes, but we expect that it's enough to have a logarithmic length for the interval. So there is a lot of work left on the area. But well, it's natural in analytic number theory. If we can't do something, then we try to do it on average. So what if one only requires that almost all intervals contain primes, which we don't ask for all x, the short interval contains primes, what if we are happy with almost all interval containing primes? And for this, there is a variant of Hux's prime number theory which says that for intervals of length x to 1 over 6 plus epsilon, we have for almost all x's, we have an asymptotic formula for the number of primes. And uh, the proof is based on the same zero density estimate, and it has also resisted improvements. And again, if one just wants a lower bound for the number of primes, one can do better. One can go into intervals of length x to 1 over 20 by a back of here. But we are, this is still far from what's expected to be true. One expects that as soon as h tends to infinity with x, then almost all intervals of length h times log x contains primes for almost all x. So here we are still have sort of the polynomial dependency for the interval length, but we expect that sort of log, that the log length interval suffices. And getting back to the Gego analog, we mostly have our Legos in one room. So fortunately, there is no analog with primes in almost all sort intervals. We don't have Legos everywhere. OK, so then primes in almost all sort intervals. There are some conditional results that actually establish the conjecture, but one needs some strong conjectures. So one expects that the interval of length h log x always contains primes, or for almost all x contains primes as soon as h tends to infinity. And he, Brown, has managed to solve this 30 years ago, but he had to assume both the Riemann hypothesis and the pair correlation conjecture for zeros of the theta. So Riemann hypothesis says that all the zeros are on the half line, but the pair correlation conjecture also gives some information about the imaginary parts of the zeros, how they are distributed. So he had to make some strong conjectures, but this allowed him to access all the conjecture. And with my student, Yuri Merikovsky, we are working uh, on the same conjecture, but under different assumption, we are working on the, under the unlikely assumption that there are exceptional characters. And uh, our, this ongoing work, we are finishing writing up the paper, but this is what we think is one of the corollaries in the paper. So if there is a sequence of moduli food say and primitive quadratic characters chi, such that the sequence of food says satisfied such a relation, don't pay too much attention to it if you don't want, but we have the such characters that either the corresponding L function L1 chi is exceptionally small, or we have an exceptional real zero of the L function of the corresponding L function, which is exceptionally close to the one line, so called exceptional zero, then we can show that for almost all why, why we have that, that the interval of length h with the h over log x tending to infinity, the expected length, we have the expected number of primes. So we are making a, an unlikely assumption that there are so called exceptional zero. So these are violations 
to the general extreme hypothesis. Nobody expects that they exist, but we haven't found the analytic number theory community hasn't found a way to prove out their existence. So, so people are working on results that work under the assumption that such exceptional things exist. And then we try to prove the things unconditionally, we can at least assume that there are no exceptional characters that somehow might help. Anyway, I will move on to the next thing, which is almost primes. So because it's difficult to find primes in such very short interval, one can ask somewhat easier questions. One can ask about almost primes. So I'm saying that there are two different notions of almost primes. So there are PK numbers that have at most K prime factors, and there are the EK numbers that have exactly K prime factors. And they, it's a bit different to work with these two things. And as for the EK numbers, which are more difficult because one requires that they are exactly K prime factors, Yoni Teravainen has shown that almost all intervals of length log X to 3.51 contain an E2 number, and this is a number with exactly two prime factors. And uh, that's, of course, much shorter than what you know about primes when we needed to have that intervals of length x to 1 over 20. And here we have just the smallest power of log x. And on the other hand, for the P2 numbers, we know that all intervals of length x to 101 over 232 contain P2 numbers, note in particular that this is quite a bit shorter than x to half, which was the Riemann hypothesis barrier for the primes. So it's easier to work with these almost primes than it's with the primes. And uh, I will, for the almost all intervals for the PK numbers, Friedland and Ivanets have made sketch an argument that almost all intervals of H log X contain P3 numbers, which is what is expected to be true for the primes. And uh, I have a preprint where I saw this for the P2 numbers instead of P3 numbers. So the almost all intervals of H log X contain P2 numbers as soon as X tends to infinity. So H tends to infinity with X. So this sort of shows that this E2 numbers and P2 numbers are easier to handle than the actual primes. And uh, back to the Legos. There are some almost Legos by other trademarks, but I have no experience, so I don't know if they are good approximation. Uh, my understanding is that they might be more difficult to work with rather than easier to work with. So it's a bit different from the almost primes. Okay. Uh, and now I have taken care of the first two things, primes and almost primes, and let me move to the Möbius function then. So they let me first define the Möbius function. So it's denoted by mu, and mu n is minus one to k if n has distinct prime factors, k distinct prime factors. So if n has odd number of prime factors, it's minus one, and if it has even number of prime factors, it's plus one. Uh, if n has a repeated prime factor, if n has any repeated prime factor, if n is not square free, then it's zero. And uh, if one look at the generating Dirichlet series of the Möbius function, it turns out that it's one over zeta. So it's it turns out that the Möbius function is very closely related to the von Mangold function whose generating Dirichlet series was minus zeta prime over zeta. So in particular, this has the essentially the same poles as this one, except that it doesn't have a pole at s equal to one, but otherwise the, it has poles at zeros of the zeta function, like the minus theta prime over theta. And in particular, using similar arguments as for the showing the relation between the prime number theorem and theta, it's possible to show that the Zeta function not having any zeros with real part of s equal to one is equivalent to the fact that the average of the Möbius function is zero. And similarly, Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to the fact that the Möbius function average is very close to zero. Um, and so I find this quite interesting that the prime number theorem which tells about primes is equivalent to the fact that there are roughly the same number of integers with odd number of prime factors as the integers with the 
even number of prime factors. So at the first sight, this looks like a weaker thing, but it turns out that they are equivalent. But it, in short intervals, the equivalence doesn't hold anymore. And unfortunately, I don't have any regular analogs about the Möbius function. Okay, so let's now go to discussing Möbius function in short intervals. And uh, until 2014, the story for the Möbius function was exactly the same as for the Möbius, for, for the old Mangold function. So for instance, Motohashi and Ramohandra independently adapted Huxley's proof of the prime number theorem to show that in the same interval length x to 7 over 12, one has cancellation in the Möbius function. And similarly, it was known that for almost all x's, Möbius has cancellation in the of length x to 1 over 6 plus epsilon. So it was exactly the essentially the same proof at work for the Möbius function as for the one mangold function, just there is no main term this time. But since 2014 or 2016, there has been quite a bit of progress with the Möbius function, but essentially no progress with the primes. So it has turned out that the case of the Möbius function is easier than the case of the primes. In particular, this almost all interval result now is known to hold for any age standing to infinity with x. So you can take intervals of length log, 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 log x, say, and by my work with Maxim Brasivir, it is known that almost all those intervals, the Möbius function has cancellation, it averages to zero. And uh, what we crucially used in the proof was that the typical number n has prime factors from certain convenient ranges. And this, of course, is certainly not true for the primes. They don't have, don't have prime factors from convenient intervals. They are themselves the only prime factor. So this is the difference between studying the Möbius function and studying the von Mangold function. And uh, we had this result for the almost all intervals from 2016. But it's quite natural to ask, what about all intervals can one get the analogous result. And this is something that Yoni Teravan and I have recently done. We have managed to get a similar result for the Möbius function in all short intervals, except that the quality of the result is not as good. We have to take intervals of length x to 0.55 rather than x to half, which is sort of the barrier of all Dirichlet polynomial methods. But anyway, we have been able to improve on the result of Huxley and Mutohashi and Ramahandra, who had to stop at 7 over 12 also for the Möbius. We have managed to show that for the Möbius, we can go into shorter intervals than for the primes. And so this is 7 over 12 is 0.5833, and we get 0.55. And it's worth noting that even on the Freeman hypothesis, we can't get beyond half. So it's not, not so small improvement as it looks at the first slide. OK, so now I will have a bit of time to talk about how to prove, prove things in this area. I have presented quite a few theorems by other people and by myself, but now I will sort of give some general ideas about how to, how to prove things related to primes or almost primes or Möbius. And I will say a few words about proofs of some of the theorems I have, represent, I have presented. First, there's often two steps in such a proof. If you want to prove something about primes, there's usually two steps, a combinatorial step and an analytic step. And uh, in combinatorial step, we use some sort of combinatorial identity or some sort of sieve, which reduces the problem to so-called type one and type two sums. And uh, the analytic step involves estimating these type one and type two sums. So I will give a bit more details in the next few slides. So first, the combinatorial step. There are various choices of the combinatorial identity or C one can use, and it de de depends on the problem, what is the best way to do the combinatorial step. But the, perhaps the most simplest, to, simplest thing to represent is the Wohan's identity. And it's an identity. This identity actually I have added here sums of n between x and 2x, but this actually holds for every n for any point-wise. So we could just look at n here and n equal to bc here and n equal to abc here and n equal to abc here. But anyway, this is the Ohan identity, which can be shown either by 
by looking at the one mangled function can be written as a convolution of Möbius and log, and one can work out this the composition from there, or one can look at the corresponding dirigate polynomials and get the, the composition from there. This looks quite very, at first sight, it doesn't look very nice, but it's actually very convenient. But I don't go into details of how to derive this identity, but it's an identity. And the first question is, why is it useful? This thing on the left-hand side looks much nicer than the thing on the right-hand side. But if one looks at each of these terms, we see that this sum of the von Mangold function, we can take the alpha endpoints as to be a characteristic function of a short interval if we want to study von Mangold at short intervals. And then we have two different sort of sums, type one sums, which are sums where one of the coefficients is smooth. So here we have the C has only the coefficient log C here, which is very smooth. And uh, here A also is very smooth has coefficient one, which is smooth. So we can write these first two terms in the form that it's oh, actually the first term here. Here in the form that it's the sum over alpha m n times a m. And then there's no coefficient with the n or something very smooth. And uh, this is called the type one sum. And here one can use utilize the fact that we have uh, a smooth variable n here. One can use, for instance, Poisson summation or something like that to handle the n sum here inside. And then if you look at this sum here, for, for instance, the third sum, then we have that the b and c are at most x to 1 over t. And because the product abc is around of size x, it means that also b and c are at most of size x to 2 over 3 each. So it can be written as a type 2 sum where we have a product of two variables and the coefficients am and bn, but we know that the variab variable m, say, is between x to 1 over 3 and x to 2 over 3, which makes it a real beginner form. And uh, this beginner structure is, is useful for estimating the sum. One can, for instance, use cosy swartz to get rid of one of the ams, and then one has a smooth sum inside or do something else. And the second sum here is a combination. Part of it is a type 1 sum, and part of it is a type two sum. But anyway, we can use the Wohan identity to split into type one and type two sums. And then we have to do the analytic step where we try to estimate these type one and type two sums. And uh, for instance, if we want to study short intervals, if we want to study primes in short intervals, and we have got a type two sum where we have mn, ambn type here, then one can use Dirichlet polynomials through Perron's formula, which is very closely related to the contour integration formula I had in the beginning. And it allows us to show that the short average of the short interval is very close to the long average over the long interval if we can show that the mean value of the corresponding Dirichlet polynomial in the D aspect is there's some cancellation going on on in the mean of the Dirichlet polynomial. So we have moved from a problem on primes to a complex integral. And to handle this integral of a, and in the complex plane, there are some known mean value results for the Dirichlet polynomials. And in particular, mean squares can be handled. And also, there are some large value results which say that they can't be large for many points t and so on. And using this, one can study, study such an average of the Dirichlet polynomials. So this allows one to, one to get, get results for short intervals. And as for the problems that I, or theorems that I have been describing, uh, I described the theorem about almost primes in almost all short intervals. Let me move to the next slide for, for a bit so that I can show the theorem. The theorem said that almost all intervals of length h log x contain p2 numbers as soon as h tends to infinity. So for that, we have the combinatorial tool, which is Rehert's weighted sieve. And if one uses a typical sieve like Rehert's weighted sieve with a beta sieve, then one has to only study type 1 information. Type 1 information is sufficient for that. But such sieves that only use type 1 information can never catch primes due to the parity barrier. 
So they, that's why we get P2 numbers that are products of at most two primes. But on the other hand, in the such short intervals, we can't prove any type two information. We can only prove type one information. So that's why we have to have to really reduce to the type one sums and contend with P2 numbers. But there, there are some analytic uh, a combinatorial step we use, use a weighted sieve, and there we use the beta sieve inside the weighted sieve. And on the other hand, for the problem of Möbius function in short intervals, this showing that the Möbius has cancellation in intervals of length 0 0.55, we have we use two different identities this in the combinatorial step. We first use Ramirez identity, which allows us to take out a very small prime factor. And after that, we use heat press identity, which takes care of the rest. It decomposes the remaining long sum into, a, into factors that are either smooth or short. And uh, in the previous proofs, there is, a, as I told you, the classical way to study Möbius in short intervals is to use Huxley's zero density estimate, but there is also a proof by Heath Brown on Huxley's prime number theorem, where he instead uses Heath Brown's identity for the composition. So our proof is similar to that one, except that we first use Ramirez identity to get additional flexibility. We take out one very small prime factor using Ramirez identity, and it allows us to take care of certain sums that one can't take care of otherwise certain terms coming from the heat trans identity that would be impossible to deal with otherwise. And uh, for the analytic step in these problems in for the problem in primes in almost all sort intervals, the analytic step we use Kusterman sums. So we we study the mean square of the type one sum and uh, we reduce it to some Kusterman sums, and uh, for that we can use, for instance, the for Barry Friedland the one it's bounds on Kusterman sums, and that gives us the required arithmetic information, and we get the Gewehr of distribution slightly better than half, which is what is needed. I think five over nine in the paper, something like this. And uh, in the problem on Möbius in short intervals, we use the Dirichlet polynomial approach I described in the previous slide. But thanks to using the Ramare identity, we don't just have a bilinear form here, but we have at least a trilinear form where we have a small prime variable which makes using these different mean and large value theorems more efficient. Okay, so I already came back to the theorems while discussing the proofs. Uh, oh, I didn't discuss the proof of the exceptional character thing, but it's quite a bit different from everything else because it's yeah it uses yeah we still use use some similar things it's sort of combinatorial but it, it makes work quite different that you assume that there is exceptional character so I don't go into go into that but anyway so we saw that almost all intervals contain p2 numbers and with Teravainen that we Möbius function has cancellation in shorter intervals than was known before. And uh, this second result with Teravine and it's, it applies more widely. We have other applications of the method as well. So for instance, we can use it to, for E2 numbers. We can show an asymptotic formula for the number of products of exactly two primes in intervals of length at least x.55. So for the primes, we know an asymptotic formula in intervals of length x to 7 over 12. But for product of two primes, we can do an asymptotic formula for intervals of length x.55, which is a bit, a bit shorter. Anyway, this is all I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs>